Hey there! Is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community, and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So, no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So, welcome to church. You are listening to KCT Cornerstone Online Live. My name is Newton Ha. On today's Bible, April 29th, 2022, preached by Pastor Joseph Park. I'll be reading the narration that will be autocast through Facebook and YouTube channels. Today's mystery message is the disciples' invoice. Luke chapter 14, verse 25 to 35. A large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, If you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else, your father and your mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you could not be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you could not be my disciple. But don't begin until you cost you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there is enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money. And then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there is a person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. Or what king will go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 can defeat the 20,000 soldiers marching against him? And if he can't, he will send a delegation to discuss terms of peace while the enemy is still far away. So you cannot become a disciple without giving up everything you own. Salt is good for seasoning, but if it loses its flavor, how do you make it salty again? Flavorless salt is good neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown away. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. You are listening to KCT Cornerstone Online Live. My name is Newton Ha. On today's Bible, April 29th, 2022, preached by Pastor Joseph Park. I'll be reading the narration that will be autocast through Facebook and YouTube channels. Today's mystery message is the disciples' invoice. Luke chapter 14, verse 25 to 35. 
A large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, If you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else, your father and your mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you could not be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you could not be my disciple. But don't begin until you cost you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there is enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money. And then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there is a person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. Or one king will go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 can defeat the 20,000 soldiers marching against him. And if he can't, he will send a delegation to discuss terms of peace while the enemy is still far away. So you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. Salt is good for seasoning, but if it loses its flavor, how do you make it salty again? Flavorless salt is good neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown away. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand.
Shall we turn now in our Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14? Tonight we'll begin in verse 25. We are entering into the final weeks of the ministry of Jesus. He is on his way to Jerusalem where he is to be crucified. Luke gives us an insight into a particular Sabbath day, beginning with chapter 14. And we'll stay with Jesus on this Sabbath day through chapter 17, verse 10. It begins with his invitation by a Pharisee to come and have a Sabbath day dinner at the Pharisee's house. An obvious setup because also among the invited guests was a man with the dropsy, a disease that causes the tissues to retain water in the tissues and tremendous swelling of the body. When Jesus came to dinner, saw the man that was there, he realized, no doubt, the whole thing was planned. And so he said, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days? And they had no answer for that. And so he healed the man with the dropsy. And then he began to comment concerning the feast. He saw how that the invited guests were vying for the best places, the seats of honor. And he said, when you're invited to a feast, don't look for the seats of honor. If you go to the head table and you sit there, you know, you're apt to be embarrassed because the master of the feast may come along and say, oh, I'm sorry, we've reserved this place for someone who is more important than you. And in stepping down, uh, you know, in front of everybody, you'll be red-faced and shame-faced and also take a lower seat, take the lowest seat in the house. And when the master comes and sit, sees you sitting in that seat, he says, oh, come on up to this better table. Better to be lifted up than to be put down. Jesus said, if you seek to exalt yourself, you'll be abased. But if you'll humble yourself, you'll be exalted. Just good principles. And then he sort of rebuked the man who had invited him to the feast. Because he ob observed that the man had invited all of the important dignitaries of the city. It was the wealthier class. It was obviously an attempt to this man to elevate himself in the social uh, structure of the community. Jesus said you'd be better off to go out and invite the poor people. You see, those that you've invited, they're obligated now to invite you back. Your motives weren't really benevolent. Your motives are really to just better yourself. You should invite the poor, the lame, those that can't return the invitation. And then he spoke a couple of parables about feast. In the one parable, he talks about this great man who had made a big supper and had invited many guests. And at the time for the dinner, they sent out to the invited guest and they began one after another to offer their excuses. One said, I've bought a field, I better go look at it. The other said, I've bought a yoke of oxen, I better go try them out. Another said, I've got a wife and I can't come. And so... The master of the feast said, well, go out then into the streets and invite the street people to come in. The poor, the lame, the blind, the maimed. 
And the servants came back and said, we've gone out into the streets and find them all in. There's still room. He said, then go out to the countryside, go out the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in. And Jesus was, of course, talking about the marriage supper of the Lamb. The Jews, the invited guests, offer their excuses for not wanting to come. And so the gospel being taken to the Gentiles, out to the highways and the hedges, and the message to the Gentiles is a compelling message to come and eat of the great feast that God has prepared for his groom, his son, and his son's bride. Now, Jesus leaves the supper. He goes out into the streets. It hasn't been a pleasant, cordial atmosphere with the Pharisees. It rarely was with Jesus. It was tense. He had violated their traditions again. He angered them by healing this man on the Sabbath day. He has again sort of made his little digs at their exclusivity. But now he goes out in the streets and he gets a warm reception. The crowds are waiting for him. The multitudes are there waiting and as they look at him, you can see in their eyes the commitment, the adoration, the worship. Like, Lord, we want to be with you. We want to go with you. We will follow you wherever you go. We want to be your disciples. And so there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, these great multitudes that are now following him through the streets, he addresses them. And Jesus says, If any man will come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. What in the world does Jesus mean? First of all, it is apparent what he doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that to follow Jesus Christ, I have to hate all of my relatives. <laughs> to interpret it as such would be to interpret it exactly opposite to all of the teaching of Jesus Christ. For the heart and the core of his teaching was love. In fact, he said, you have heard that it hath been said, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Do good unto those who persecute you. Pray for those that despitefully use you, and so shall you be the children of the Father. In other words, you're following God's example who loves his enemies. God loved you when you were still an enemy to him. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave his son as a propitiation for our sins, for God manifested his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. So obviously he is not telling us that to be a disciple, we've got to hate all of our relatives. But you say that's what it says.
Jesus had just given a parable in which one of the excuses that was offered for a man not coming to the feast was that he had married a wife. In other words, my family relationships and my family obligations are holding me back from coming to the feast. And Jesus is tying this next phrase with the previous parable that he had spoken in the house. And what he is saying is that your love for him and your commitment to him has to be deeper and greater than any family commitment that you have. You have to love him supremely. God forbid that it should be, but if some family relationship would hold you back from a full commitment to Jesus Christ, you must choose your commitment to him over the dearest relationship that you may have on earth. And if a husband or a wife or a mother or a father or a brother or a sister would try to hold you back and would restrict you and would keep you from your full commitment to Jesus Christ, in establishing your priorities, he's got to be first. And your commitment to him has to be above any family relationship that you may experience. So it is a comparative thing. And it means that Christ has to be above any other relationship that you have. If you want to really be his disciple, he's got to be tops on the list. Immediately, we're sort of shocked, really, at the severity of the cost of discipleship. Jesus is not really saying, look, if you choose to follow me, all of your problems are going to dissolve with the morning dew. Your life is going to be filled with just glory and blessings all the way. You'll have no more problems. It is a false evangelism that seeks to bid people to come to Christ in order that they might enjoy a beautiful, glorious, rose-petaled pathway as they trip their way into heaven. <laughs> Tis not so. And Jesus did not paint any rosy pictures of discipleship. He did not say it's going to be easy. He did not say you're not going to have any problems at all. The end of your problems are when you receive Jesus Christ. He didn't say that. Because that is not at all true. It could be the beginning of problems. Jesus was very plain on the terms of discipleship. He wants a person to realize what it cost before he commits. And so here is an adoring multitude of people following him down the street, coming after him. And he turns to them and said, look, if you really want to come after me, this is what it's going to cost. He said, 
You're going to have to love me above and beyond every other relationship. Even have to love me more than you love yourself. He speaks here about hating yourself. Boy, I don't hear much of that from the pulpit today. <laughs> I hear so much preaching on self-esteem, loving yourself. And yet Jesus said, look, you can't be my disciple if you love yourself. If you're going to be my disciple, you've got to hate yourself. Christ has to be preeminent. <laughs> He's not promising that they can drive Mercedes and all they have to do is speak the word of faith and they can live a life of luxury and ease. That God wants them to be millionaires. He gives them a very heavy charge. Secondly, whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. This is, I think, a part of that not loving yourself. Because God has a cross. And he's not saying taking up my cross at this point. He's saying take up your cross. But what does that mean? I think that there are a lot of people that when their mother-in-law moves into the house, they say, well, I guess this is just the cross I have to bear, you know. <laughs> Or you get sick or, or some other, you know, thing happens that's unpleasant. You say, well, I guess that's just the cross I have to bear. The cross does involve suffering. But not suffering for yourself but suffering for the good of someone else. It's a part of the denial of self. It is giving yourself for someone else. That's what Jesus was doing on the cross. He was giving himself for you. He was suffering for you. He was enduring that for you. And so the cross in our life is when we are making a sacrifice for someone else's benefit. Again, not looking after myself first. The cross actually entailed that total submission to the will of the Father. When in the Garden of Gethsemane, as Jesus was praying, and Luke tells us that his sweat turned to blood, falling to the ground, being in great agony, he said, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. He was talking about the cross. And he is there declaring if there is any other way that man can be redeemed. Let's take the alternate plan. If man by religion, by efforts, by sincerity can redeem himself, then let's, let's go for it. Nevertheless, he said, not my will, but your will be done. And there was the submitting of himself totally to the will of the Father. And that's what the cross entails. 
my total surrender of my life to what God wants, to the will and the purpose of God for me. And if I'm to come after Jesus Christ, if I'm to be his disciple, I must make that total commitment of my life to the will of God. And then Jesus said, verse 33, Whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he has cannot be my disciple. So the cost of discipleship is a heavy cost. It is, first of all, putting Christ above every other relationship that you have. Your love for him supreme. Secondly, it is putting yourself totally in God's hands, a complete commitment to his will. Finally, it is a forsaking of all that you have. Now, a disciple is a follower. And Jesus is not asking you to do anything that he did not do. And he is saying, look, you want to be my disciple? You want to be a follower of me? Here's what I have done. My commitment is above any family relationship. You remember when he was just 12 years old? How he had come to Jerusalem with his parents for the feast. And as they were journeying home, where they got a day's journey out, in the evening, they figured Jesus was with some of his cousins or something, and in the evening... They went looking for him and he wasn't around. And so they inquired, no, and we haven't seen him all day. So they had to come back to Jerusalem. And they searched and they found him finally a couple of days later. And he was sitting there in the temple talking theology with the priests and the scribes who were marveling at the wisdom of this child. And his mother Mary rebuked him. Don't you know how worried we were about you? Don't you ever do this again, you know? And he turned to her and said, Didn't you realize that I must be about my father's business? Even at that age. Later on, when Jesus was ministering at Capernaum, and they were bringing people from all over the countryside to be healed. The crowds were pressing in. You couldn't even get into the house where he was. There were sick people all around. And they continued to press on Jesus, not even giving him a chance to take time to eat. But he was so touched by the needs of the people. That he just continued to minister to them without taking time to eat. And his mother got worried about him and she gathered his brothers and they came down and they were going to rescue him from the crowds and from himself. He doesn't have enough sense to take care of himself. And so when they came to the house where Jesus was, there was such a crowd they couldn't even get in. So Mary sent a message in. Tell Jesus his mother and his brothers are outside here waiting for him. We want to see him. And when the message came to Jesus, he said, Who is my mother? Who is my brother? And looking around about the people that were sitting there listening, he said, 
Whoever does the will of the Father, the same as my mother and my brother. But his commitment, you see, to God was, was greater than the family ties. If I want to follow him, then my commitment has to be greater than my family ties. How beautiful it is when a family is in unity into that, in that commitment to Jesus Christ. It's wonderful that you don't have to forsake husband or wife or mother or father. It's glorious when all of you have made that commitment. Oh, what a glorious family it is when we're all committed to Jesus Christ and we are all centered in him. If you want to be a follower, a disciple of Jesus Christ, you've got to put God's will above your own. Jesus did that. If you want to follow him, you have to do what he did. You have to set aside your own will, your own wish, your own desire, and you have to submit unto the Father's desire. Finally, you have to be willing to forsake all. Jesus forsook his throne in glory. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God and thought it not robbery to be equal with God, took upon himself the form of a man and came in likeness of man as a servant and was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, forsaking the glory, forsaking splendors of God's kingdom, came to earth. And we also have to be willing to forsake One day a rich young ruler came to Jesus, fell at his feet and said, Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, Why do you call me good? There's only one good, that's God. Notice Jesus is either saying I'm no good or he's saying I'm God. Don't confuse that scripture. I'm sure he's not saying I'm no good. What he is saying to this young man is, hey, you've recognized something, fellow. Do you know what you've recognized? Jesus said, keep the commandments. He said, which ones? And Jesus rattled off the second table of the law, his relationship to his fellow man. He said, hey, I'm batting 100%. I've done all of that from my youth up. But I'm still lacking something. Jesus said, well, if you want to be complete, go and sell what you have and take the money, distribute it to the poor, and come and follow me and you'll have riches in heaven. And the young man went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. And Jesus said, oh, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Really, it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a man who trusts in riches to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Peter said, Lord, we have forsaken everything to follow you. Jesus said, no man has forsaken houses or homes Brothers or sisters, husbands or wives, lands, for my sake and for the kingdom, but what in this world he will receive a hundredfold and in the world to come life eternal. The Lord will never be a debtor to you. But yet 
he asked for that forsaking, forsaking of all to follow him in order to be his disciple. Now, Jesus, in between here, gave a couple of parables. You notice we jump from verse 27 to 33. And in verses 27, or verses 28, rather, to 32, he speaks a couple of parables. Parable, first of all, about a man building a tower. For which of you intending to build a tower doesn't sit down first and counts the cost to see whether or not he has enough to finish it? Lest, unfortunately, after he's laid the foundation, he's not able to finish it. And all of those that behold it began to mock him, saying, this man began to build, but he was not able to finish it. Going to put on a room addition. Great idea. So you tear off the roof. In order to tie the new building on. But then, as soon as you get it framed, you find out you don't have enough money to put the stucco on. You put the roof on. And so you have to put plastic all over everything. And for years, you know, people drive by and see this rotting lumber up there covered with plastic. And they say, oh, what a shame. Started to build. They didn't have enough money to finish. The Lord says, no, you don't do that. You sit down, first of all, and you estimate what it's going to cost to build the whole thing. And then you determine whether or not you have enough money to do it. The second parable is similar to it, only it's now involving warfare. The first one involves building, the second involves war. What king going to make war against another king? Sitteth not down first. Now King Hussein wishes he had done this. Who is the, yeah, the Iraqi king boy? sits not down first and consults whether he is able with his 10,000 to meet those that are coming against him with 20,000. Or else while the other is yet a great way off, he sends an embassage and desires conditions of peace. Now with these two parables, there are two possible interpretations. And Bible scholars are divided on which interpretation is correct. As you know, parables have to be interpreted. The first possible interpretation is that Jesus saying to these people who are coming after him, who are following him, saying to them, look, you better count the cost of discipleship before you get on board. You don't want to start something you can't finish. If you make a commitment to me, you better know what you're doing and you better make sure that you're able to go through with it. Count the cost before committing yourself. If that is the correct interpretation, it is a very important thing. If we are thinking about committing ourselves to the discipleship of Jesus Christ, you should, first of all, sit down and count the cost of it. And Jesus surely is giving you three heavy costs. The second interpretation is that Jesus is actually speaking about himself before embarking on his mission. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, Jesus said to Peter's confession that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, upon this rock I will build my church 
and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He talked about building and he talked about war. I'm going to build my church. There's going to be a war. Satan is going to fight, but the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. And so it was Jesus himself who came to build his church, it, who came to battle against Satan and to destroy the power of Satan. He counted first the cost and he made his commitment. The interpretation of the parable hangs on the little word that is translated likewise in King James, verse 33. So likewise. However, the word likewise is not an accurate or good translation of the Greek word. You will find in the modern versions, in the revised versions and all, it is translated therefore. And with the translation of therefore, then you have a greater cause to believe that Jesus is speaking about himself. Having considered the cost. Having considered the battle that he was facing. Came to pay the cost and to fight the battle. Therefore, you also, if you are to follow him, have to forsake all to be his disciple because he forsook all to be your Lord. I personally like the second interpretation, but you're free to choose whichever one you like the more. Finally, Jesus closes this chapter by saying, salt is good, but if the salt has lost his savor, one of the old translations reads, but if the salt has lost its tang, I like that. There's a bit of a bite to that word. <laughs> if the salt has lost his savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It's neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said to his disciples, Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savor, it is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. In the times of Christ, salt was used for more than just seasoning. One of the primary uses of salt in that day was a preservative. Without refrigeration, it was difficult to preserve meat. And so when the meat was butchered, you would take the portion that you were going to roast immediately and you would roast it, but that which you weren't going to roast immediately, you would salt it down well. Because the salt would kill the surface bacteria and would retard the spoilage. And so salt was often in those days used as a preservative. And when Jesus said to his disciples, ye are the salt of the earth, I think that he had both meanings in mind. The Christian is to bring a savory influence into the world. But the Christian also is to be a purifying influence in the world. 
And when Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, you cannot discount that he was also thinking of the purifying value of salt. And he's declaring to us, his church, that we should have a purifying influence in the world in which we live. Now, look at the world in which we live. And in looking at what's happening in the world that, in which we live today, would you say that perhaps the salt is losing its savor? Could all of the things be happening in our society today if the church was a purifying influence that the Lord intended it to be? But look at what Jesus says is the result of the salt losing its savor. It is good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of man. Jesus said it's not good for the field or the dunghill. You see, even though the salt doesn't have any tang, doesn't have any preservative quality left, you still don't want to throw it into the fields because it will kill the vegetation. And you don't want to put it on the dunghill. Because you can't use the fertilizer if it's got salt in it. Because as you fertilized your fields, it would kill the vegetation. So what they would do with the salt was throw it on the pathways where they wanted to kill the vegetation. And... Thus it was trodden under the foot of man. The pathways were strewn with salt to destroy the vegetation and thus trodden under the foot of man. I see in this an ultimatum really to the church. Jesus says, look, either you be a purifying influence in the world in which you live or you're going to find yourself crushed beneath the world it'll crush the church to death and unfortunately here in even in the united states they are beginning in many areas to crush the church i get bulletins of how in various parts of the united states religious freedoms and liberties are being taken away A pastor and his wife were arrested just recently in Long Island, New York, because the neighborhood has a vendetta against the church. It's about the fifth time they've been arrested. All of the charges have been dropped, but recently they were arrested and placed in jail again. And it's just plain harassment by the world. Salt has lost its savor. It's starting to be crushed under the foot of man. Samson was the saving salt to the nation of Israel as long as he kept his vow to God. When he broke his vow, what happened? He was crushed under the weight of the fallen Philistines. Esther became the saving salt for the people of God. But in order to become that saving salt, she had to make a commitment and she said, I will go in, and if I perish, I perish. Jesus, in talking about commitment, Jesus, in talking about forsaking all, Jesus, in talking about priorities, him being first and above all else, speaks about salt. You are the salt. But as salt, you've got to have some tanginess. You've got to have some preservative influence. One other thing about salt, one other characteristic, is that salt makes you thirsty. And if you're doing your job, you're going to create a thirst in the hearts of those around you to know the Lord.
people seeing you are going to become thirsty to know him. God help us. The cost of discipleship is great, but the rewards of discipleship are greater. No man has forsaken houses, homes, brothers, families, for my sake and the gospels. In this world, a hundredfold in the world to come, eternal life. Yes, it costs, but oh, what rewards. Shall we pray? Thank you, Lord, that you paid the price. You went all the way for us. Your commitment was complete. Lord, help us that we too might pay the price. That our commitment might be complete. That our love for you will be supreme, greater than any other love, even the most dear and closest loves that we experience in this world. May our love for you exceed them. May our commitment to you be total. Lord, may we indeed Take up our crosses and follow you, forsaking ourselves, our own ways, our own wishes, our own desires, our own ambitions, that we might follow the example that you have given and that we might truly be your disciples in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we stand? Next week, we get into that interesting chapter of the prodigal son. Probably one of the most misinterpreted of all parables that Jesus gave. It's interesting, and I want you to read the 15th chapter. The prodigal son is not the first parable. It is in a series of parables. And I want you to... Seek to understand the true meaning of the parable of the prodigal son. Pray about it. Read it over. Study it carefully. Study it in the context of the whole chapter. And then I want you to be able to tell me next Wednesday night just what was Jesus getting at in this parable of the prodigal son. That's your assignment. See you next Thursday night. <laughs>